Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Carly Ann, and I'm going to be uh, talking to you today of our, our current research rundown uh, about a man named John Bell. Um, we're going to get started just here in a few minutes. Um, he was an enslaved person in the mid-19th century, and he's going to be our main topic today. So whenever uh, we're ready, we're going to get started. All right, so um, let's go to the next slide, if it will let me. Okay, so who is John Bell? Um, this was my first reaction in 2018. Um, I'm a reference archivist here at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. And I was given a research request, which is part of some of our job lead duties here. We do research for people who submit them. And um, I was given a request to look for a man named John Bell. And that's a person that I had never heard of. Um, and I was asked to find out as much as I could about him. Um, the patron who made the request um, told me that he was an enslaved person. Um, he was enslaved by a man named William Rufus King. And he was supposedly supposed to be freed after King's death. They also told me that they believed he had a sister. Um, they had, the patron had found this image that you see here um, online. And this is from our, actually our digital collection. It's a postcard dated around 1901. And it's an image of a, of an African-American woman. Um, as you can see, she's, she's got a basket full of bread and the photograph is labeled Old Mammy. Now, you know, seemingly you just look at this and think that it's just a postcard depicting an older woman. Um, but if you flip it over on the back, and I don't have an image of the back to show you, but if you flip it over on the back, there were some handwritten transcriptions there. And these, this handwriting stated that this woman depicted on this postcard was really a woman named Nancy, and her brother was a man named John Bell, who had been an enslaved person, and he was the a slave to William Rufus King. So here's that name again. So that really piqued my interest, and so I started to look into who is King? Who is this William Rufus King man? So for those of you that have maybe never heard of him, um, he was a lifelong politician in North Carolina and in Alabama. As you can see here, I've listed some of his um, accomplishments politically. Um, and he was starting out in the House of Commons in North Carolina in the early 1900s. And he was also a U.S. representative of North Carolina. He became the um, a staff member to the U.S. Minister of Russia. Um, he eventually became a senator for Alabama, um, which he was one for a very long time. And then um, he was also once the U.S. minister to France. Finally, um, and probably his biggest accomplishment is that he was the 13th U.S. vice president of the United States um, in 1853, which makes him the highest um, elected official from Alabama. And this is a photograph of him here. Well, not a photograph. It's an image of him here. And um, I got this from the Encyclopedia of Alabama. So a little bit more about him. Um, King was born around 1786 in North Carolina. He lived there until the early 1810s during a land rush to Alabama, which um, often is referred to as the as Alabama fever. It was one of the um, first land rushes um, in the United States. He had several family members that had already moved to Alabama and established themselves here, one being his brother Thomas. Thomas had actually moved here um, and moved to Tuscaloosa County. Um, and by 1818, William Rufus King has also moved to Alabama, but he's decided to settle in Dallas County. And he's established a home there, and I, he called this home Chestnut Hill. He and his family owned large amounts of land in the area. Um, he himself owned large amounts of land in Lowndes and Dallas counties. And he also still maintained um, 
you know, land in North Carolina as well. So his homestead was located on the Alabama River, and it actually still holds the name King's Bend today. Um, he was part of the founding and naming of Selma, and um, you can see a lot of things around um, Selma are still going to hold his name, um, and there are markers dedicated to him. Um, being a U.S. Senator and a later Vice President, King split most of his time between Washington, D.C. and Dallas County, and later in his life, he became quite ill, and he died very early into his Vice Presidency, so he only was the Vice President for about a month. So, um, this image here is a depiction of King's Bend. Um, it is a township and range map, and it is the portion of uh, Dallas County that um, he actually owned. So, you can see um, King's Bend there. Um, the yellow is William Rufus King's property. You can kind of see how it bends up. That's King's Bend. The red color is his brother's, actually. Um, Thomas. So Thomas eventually purchased some land in Dallas County. So while I was trying to find John Bell, I looked through items that I could find associated with King. Um, there was the Nancy Bell postcard I had mentioned earlier, and it yielded some good information. Um, it indicated that Nancy and her brother John were purchased by King in Washington, D.C. So that gave me a clue that Maybe Nancy and John were originally from elsewhere, which tracks. King was a prominent politician, so he would have spent most of his time in D.C. anyway. Next, I searched for any mentions of John Bell within the William Rufus King family papers, which we have here as part of our private manuscript collections. And the big reason why I had to do this is that it can be extremely difficult to find enslaved persons. And so, in order to find enslaved persons, oftentimes you have to find the people who are enslaving them. And so, that's why I really tried hard to narrow down a timeline of William Rufus King's life and figure out what, what is he doing? What's he been up to all these years? That may help me find more information on John Bell. This collection was able to help me as it contained correspondence and family histories. And some of these even mentioned John Bell. I had built a timeline of King's life so that I could use locations of where King may have been at a certain time, and it could help me determine maybe what John's life was like, how long he may have been enslaved by King, or how old John had been. While searching through the King family papers here at the archives, I was able to find mentions of Bell. Unfortunately, most of these mentions are in passing, or what they detail cannot be confirmed because they are accounts from years later. For example, some of these family histories tell that King purchased John, Nancy, and a brother in Washington, D.C. because he was overcome when he saw them and did not want the siblings to be separated. But the person giving the information is not King, and it is, it, and was not there at the time either. Therefore, it is unclear how accurate this account may be, or how biased it may be. Another story depicts how when John Bell was the U.S. Minister of France, Bell accompanied him to France. Due to laws there at the time, once Bell stepped on French ground, he was automatically a free person, and no longer enslaved. However, Lore, family, King family lore, indicates that Bell willingly chose to stay enslaved to King despite being told that he was now a free person. Stories like this were being told many years after the fact by descendants of King, so their validity is in question. However, they're still helpful to know. For example, um, this story, whether or not it's true, um, tells me that John Bell was in King's life while he was the minister of France. So that gives me a timeline of, well, okay, so John Bell must have been enslaved by King in the 1840s. Um, that, those why, that's why those stories are helpful. It doesn't necessarily matter um, if the actual story itself is true or untrue. It's important to know that there are little details that may help us. John Bell's age is overall unclear. Some accounts do refer to him as a young man or a teenager, so we can assume that he may possibly be a young person during his time with King. Um, 
And that's helpful because, um, you know, at first when you're just talking about someone who is an enslaved person, that doesn't mean they're a child. It doesn't mean they're an adult. Um, you know, for all I knew, he could have been uh, King's age. So it's helpful to hear people reference him as maybe a young person or a teen, even though I really don't have any information other than just that to say one way or the other. Bell is often referred to as a body servant to King. A body servant is a personal valet, butler, maid, etc. But it's important to remember that he's enslaved. Oftentimes when you hear over and over John Bell, body servant to William Rufus King, you forget that he's not really a body servant. He's an enslaved person. He's an enslaved body servant or enslaved personal valet. The photo you see here is from the Library of Congress's digital collection, and it is depicting the view of Washington, D.C. during the mid-19th century. As you can see, Washington, D.C. is, is called Washington City here, and that was uh, what it was often referred to at the time. I chose this image because I like to think about how this is probably what John Bell saw. This is probably the view that he would see when he was in Washington, D.C., um, he definitely doesn't see the, the images that we see today, ODC, um, but he would have seen something kind of more like this. Emancipating John Bell. So William Rufus King died in April of 1853 in Dallas County. King's nephew, William T. King, inherited the bulk of his estate. King's sister, Tabitha Corngay, took ownership of Chestnut Hill, um, and most likely Nancy Bell, and his older sister, his other sister, so even older, his other sister, Helen, got his Lowndes County uh, plantation. So you can see this image here is of Chestnut Hill, so that would be what um, his sister Tabitha would have taken control of. And this is just an illustration from the 1850s, so around the same time period, um, it actually burned down years later, so it is not um, still standing King had a will when he died, and it gave pretty detailed instruction on how to divide his property amongst his family members. His will included instructions regarding enslaved persons as well, and King requested that his slaves were to be valued and divided amongst the King family members. He also stated that enslaved families are to remain together and to not be separated. For some individual enslaved persons, he had other instructions. For example, John Bell was to be given $2,000 and to be freed. King indicated that Bell would move to Liberia, Washington, D.C., or to any other free state. He also stipulated that he wanted Bell to be personally escorted to his new home and to ensure his arrival and his safety. There were other examples of King freeing enslaved persons through his will or wanting them to be freed. However, typically he just indicates their name, his wish for their freedom, and his stipulation that they move to Liberia, Washington, D.C., or any free state. Bell's instructions are the only one that include a personal escort or a monetary sum. This really piqued my interest. I knew that if Bell was freed and given money from King's estate, it would be recorded further, so it would be something I would be able to confirm. But before we get into that, let's talk about why John Bell can't stay in Alabama. So for probably most of you, as it was for me, I found it strange that John Bell would only be allowed to stay in a free state, Washington, D.C. or Liberia um, due to the bill. I wasn't sure if this would be um, King's personal um, just desire <laughs> or if this was something different. In my research, I ended up finding that in 1834, the Alabama legislature enacted a law regarding emancipation of enslaved persons. This law required that all emancipations had to be advertised in the local newspaper for 60 days. County court judges were allowed to emancipate enslaved persons. Newly freed persons then had one year to leave the state of Alabama and reside elsewhere or they would be re-enslaved. An emancipated person who would have to get special permission from the Alabama legislature to remain in the state of Alabama after their emancipation. So um, what that means is that if you are a person who is freed um, and you wanted to stay in Alabama, 
you would have to get special permission to stay or else you would be re-enslaved. So um, with that, it made more sense to me why um, Alabama would not have been included in um, some of the places where King was hoping that his um, freed enslaved persons would move. Um, Liberia was another interesting one to me. So another, uh, another interesting part was Liberia, the mention of that country. In the early 1800s, there was a movement that called for freeborn and emancipated individuals to move to Africa. The American Colonization Society was an organization that supported this movement and created the colony of Liberia for this purpose. William Rufus King was a supporter of this movement, and the American Colonization Society um, would explain why he included Liberia. His connection to that society and his support of the movement. Um, the society was mostly not supported by abolitionists in the African-American community at the time. So this image you see here is a um, from the, it's from 1854, March, and it is from the Glasgow Weekly Times. And it is an example of a emancipation advertisement. This is actually um, John Bell's. So um, you can kind of see how they worded it. They even specify that he's a body servant and it's saying that the legislature has allowed him to stay in the state. They've passed his emancipation and he can he can remain here in Alabama. But that is an example of um, what one would look like. And it's also to be noted that I actually had a really hard time finding um, an announcement in the newspaper in a state of Alabama paper. Um, there are many examples that you can find um, in those papers, but for whatever reason, I had a hard time finding one for John Bell. This one is actually from Missouri. <laughs> so um, I think I found two total that announced, um, advertised for his emancipation, and um, they were both out of state. So I, I, I really couldn't speculate what that means, but um, it was an interesting thing. Since I had the information from King's Will, um, I knew there was going to be more information out there. I knew that um, if if John Bell was freed um, and he was given money, that it would be in estate case files. So I began to search through those for Dallas County, um, and I did find further information on Bell. Estate case files are probate records that are recorded within a county. Their job is to gather information about a person's estate and determine what heirs are owed and what the deceased may be owed or owe to another person. It is also best to search for an estate case file for anyone, um, but often these will be found for those that owned property or maybe had some type of wealth. Um, also, there are typically these are typically found in the county where someone resides. Uh, King did have a substantial estate case file in Dallas County, and I was able to access this through microfilm. However, you can also access this online through Ancestry.com. There were hundreds of pages in his estate case file, and most of them are handwritten, so I had to be very careful to make sure that I didn't miss a mention of Bell. I was able to find several examples of John Bell through the process of settling King's estate. For example, there are receipts from August and September 1853 that show Bell being paid $175 total in Washington, D.C. On these records, John leaves his mark with an X, indicating that he cannot write his name. And you can see that in the image there where um, it has John Bell and then his mark with an X. In another letter in the estate case files from 1853, it is revealed that Bell is unmarried and has no independence. This at least gives us an idea of his personal life that we did not know anything about before. A January 1854 letter, William T. King, who's the nephew of King, um, who inherited the bulk of his estate, and John Bell are in Cahaba and will be going to the Capitol in Montgomery in an attempt uh, to get a bill of emancipation passed. There are also receipts in King's estate case file that show that Bell is treated by King's doctor along with several other enslaved persons um, numerous times. Could this be John Bell? Was he sick or is this someone else? Because he's just referred to as Bell, so it's unclear if um, this Bell is him or someone else. A third receipt shows that John Bell is being paid 
1705, $1,705 on January 13, 1854 in Cahaba. Bell also signs his name with an X on this receipt. This helps us see that he was in Washington, D.C. in the summer of 1853 after King's death, and by early 1854, he's in Dallas County, Alabama. On January 19, 1854, Act 231 was passed by the Alabama legislature that freed John Bell, and he is allowed to remain in Alabama if he wishes. You can see the act here on the screen, and this was from our digital collections. Um, the Alabama acts are available there, and so that's how I was able to find this. On the same day that John Bell received $1,705, there is another receipt that shows that Bell has received a total of $2,000 from the estate of William Rufus King. What is interesting about this note is that John Bell's name is signed and it's not marked by an X. The handwriting that wrote John Bell is noticeably different from the rest of the document. It is my assumption that there is actually, this could be John Bell's actual real signature. This was an incredible find for me. It gives us more insight into Bell's life. However, at the same time, it also gives me more questions. Enslaved persons were largely not legally allowed to learn to read or write. This implies that John Bell either could at least read or write his own name. It is unclear if he was literate beyond being able to write his own name or if he also knew how to uh, read and write other words as well. Is this something that he recently learned or is this something that he's known how to do for many years? Is this something that he has been openly doing or is this something that he's been hiding? We could assume that due to Bell's proximity to King, that he probably had a uh, a non-typical life than most Americans. Um, he also probably experienced and saw a lot of things that most Americans did not. That does not mean that his life was easy or everything he wanted it to be since he was an enslaved person. But he traveled more than the average person. So I would wonder if he was maybe exposed to different things um, that most people were not even though he was an enslaved person. <clears throat> it's always important to remember that Bell was an enslaved person that was not allowed their freedom until after the death of his enslaver. So what happened to John Bell? My patron and myself really wanted to know, and I still want to know. However, I was unable to locate him through census, city directories, probate records, newspapers, etc., if I did find a person that I suspected to be John Bell, I could never really confirm or deny that it was him. We do know that he got special permission from the state to be allowed to stay in Alabama. I could not pr prove that he did stay, but I also could not prove that he did not. If Nancy, the woman depicted in the postcard, really is his sister, we know that she stayed in Alabama and was most likely owned by Tabitha Cornegay, who was William Rufus King's sister, who inherited Chestnut Hill, which would have been William Rufus King's home. It could be possible that Bell wanted to stay in Alabama because he had siblings in the area or family. However, since King split his time between Alabama and Washington, D.C., we could theorize that Bell would have two. Plus, if the family lore is correct, that Bell was purchased by King in D.C., it would imply that John was probably from somewhere from that area. We just don't know enough about Bell to predict his movements after his emancipation. Unfortunately, I just could not determine one way or another where or what happened to him. But I like to think that maybe he lived a long and happy life after his emancipation. So this concludes my presentation for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Um, I work here at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. I'm a reference archivist. You can come see me in the research room. We're open Tuesday through Saturday, 8.30 in the morning to 4.30 in the afternoon. 
We're closed on state holidays, and we're also closed to the public on Monday and sa Sunday. Um, but our museum is open Monday through Saturday. Um, so you can come visit uh, the museum on Monday, but you can't visit me on Monday. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. And uh, we'll be here for a few more minutes just to kind of answer any kind of questions you may have. And um, thank you so much for coming to the, today's research rundown.